did a video about Wavertree Road last year and uh, I actually took you a little bit further. I took you onto the edge of the city centre to Grove Street and uh, we looked at some of the buildings that are there now, some of the new builds, um, the spine or the giraffe as it's known around here. But there's also another pretty strange story which relates to Wavertree and um, it's just behind those new buildings. So we're going to take a walk to it today and have a look and um, maybe ask to see what you think about the story. This is the top of Wavertree Road and this is Irvine Street. And this is what Irvine Street looked like in the 1800s. Back then it was a small village on the outskirts of Liverpool. Today we're going to talk about this guy, Joseph Williamson. Now I made a mistake earlier because I said that um, we were going to be talking about a, a strange story relating to Wavertree and what I meant to say was a strange story relating to Edge Hill because although Wavertree Road is in that direction we are actually in Edge Hill and Joseph Williamson um, gained the nickname of the Mole of Edge Hill. Anyway to start his story we're going to um, take a walk down Mason Street which is just where that um, yellow crane is. Joseph Williamson was born on the 10th of March 1769 in a small village just outside Barnsley in the West Riding of Yorkshire. At an early age his family moved to Warrington which then was in Lancashire and today is in Cheshire. When he was aged 11 he left his family and went to Liverpool where he was employed in the tobacco and snuff business of Richard Tate. He gained promotion within the business and also developed his own merchants business in partnership with Joseph Lee. In 1787 Richard Tate died and the control of the business passed to his son Thomas Moss Tate. Williamson married Thomas's sister Elizabeth. They were married in St Thomas's Church in Liverpool in 1802. The following year Williamson purchased the business from Thomas Moss Tate and from this together with his other business interests he amassed a considerable fortune. So we are on Mason Street and uh, this is the back of the Spine Building and um, we're looking basically down Brownlow Hill. Well, let's have a look from the other side. If we stand at the top of Brownlow Hill, uh, we're looking at Grove Street and this is the view. It's actually featured in a, in a couple of videos recently and um, that's the Spine. Do you remember what was here before? Well, it was this Paddington Comprehensive School which would later become the Archbishop Blanche School. Now here's an aerial view of the whole area and you can see how big the school is. It was built in either 67 or 68 and um, it was demolished in 2015 when the Archbishop Blanche School relocated to Earl Road backing on to Smithdown Road. It was really a comment by Talboy You'll Never Walk Alone who made a comment on the Brownlow Hill video when I showed the top of Brownlow Hill. He said this is where my school used to be. So I should have mentioned it then uh, I forgot all about the school, but uh, I've mentioned it now. It's uh, It was a landmark back in its day, 
and uh, I think Talboy must have started school the year it was built, 1968, he was there till 1975. So we're back on Mason Street and uh, we're heading towards Joseph Williamson's house which you can see in the distance there. We're heading right into the sun so um, it's a little bit hazy but there's the remains of his house propped up by some scaffolding. In 1805 Williamson bought an area known as Long Broom Field on Mason Street here. It was a largely undeveloped outcrop of sandstone and around this time he moved into a house on Mason Street. He then began to build more houses in Mason Street which were built without any plans and which were of the strangest description. This apparently was what he built. This was what Mason Street used to look like. The land behind the houses dropped sharply for about 20 feet, which is 6 metres. And as it was the fashion to have a large garden and orchards behind them, he built brick arches onto which the gardens could be extended. Following this, he continued to employ his workmen and recruited more to perform tasks, some of which appeared to be useless, such as moving materials from one place to another and then back again. He also used the men to build a labyrinth of underground halls and brick arched tunnels. Labour was plentiful at the time and with the ending of the Napoleonic Wars in 1816, there was even more unemployed men in Liverpool. The tunnels were built at depths between 10 feet, which is 3 metres, and 50 feet, 15 metres, and they stretched for several miles. Williamson retired from his business in 1818, but continued to be a landlord. His wife died in 1822 and he then became increasingly eccentric, devoting almost all of his time to supervising the excavations and tunnel building. In the 1830s he came into contact with George Stevenson who was building the extension of the Liverpool-Manchester Railway from Edge Hill to Lime Street stations and whose own excavations passed through those of Williamson. Williamson died in 1840, aged 71, at his home here in Mason Street, the cause of his death being water on the chest. He was buried at the Tate family vault in St Thomas's Church and left an estate worth £39,000. Now we've just come to the end of Mason Street, you probably saw the sign on the right hand side there, and we're heading down towards Smithdown Lane, and it's on Smithdown Lane that the um, Williamson Tunnels heritage site is, and um, we're going to head there now. So this is Smithdown Lane, and if we Headed off in that direction, we would come to Crown Street, which was the site of the first um, intercity railway built by George Stevenson. Whose tunnels went through Williamson's tunnels? Okay, so we're heading off to the um, area where, if you wanted to go down these tunnels, this is where you would come to. So on the left hand side behind us is Grove Street and you would just head off Grove Street onto Smith Down Lane and uh, head to here. Now if you want to go down the tunnels you can do so. At the moment it's open uh, Friday, Saturday and Sunday and I think you have to uh, ring and book a time. I think at one time you could just turn up here and go down. And I think in the summer uh, it's open a few more days. But uh, at this present moment in time, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, 
is the only times you can come. So this is Williamson's house. The excavations are in that uh, in that building there, and uh, this is where you come in. A little bit of a museum. Uh, things that they've found um, on the on their excavations can be found in here. Let's have a look at the official story of why Joseph Williamson built these tunnels. According to the account of a 19th century Liverpool antiquarian, James Stonehouse, these houses were eccentric in design and of the strangest description, without any rational plans. Williamson had built arched terraces over which the gardens could be extended. He continued to erect and alter many further buildings on the site, and this included his own house on Mason Street, which was occupied by himself and his wife. To carry out the work, he recruited a large pool of labour from among the poor and needy of the area. This included soldiers left unemployed at the end of the Napoleonic War, and according to Stonehouse, he occasionally engaged them to carry out apparently pointless tasks. His workers also excavated a series of brick arched tunnels and vaults at various depths within the sandstone. They covered a wide area, including to the boundaries of Williamson's lease and possibly beyond that. Stonehouse, who transversed parts of the tunnels in 1845, described the excavations as a labyrinth of vaulted passages, deep pits and yawning chasms, including a fearful opening beneath Grinfield Street, with two complete four-roomed houses in the side of it, connected by a spiral passage. The tunnel building activity continued until Williamson's death in 1840. In August 1867, the Liverpool Porcupine, which I guess is a newspaper, described the tunnels as being a great nuisance because drains ran straight through them, in one place creating a cesspool full of offensive water, 15 feet deep, which is 5 metres. And they were being used for dumping refuge, including down chutes built into the buildings above for, the, for this purpose. In the later 19th century, the Corporation of Liverpool began backfilling the tunnels with rubble and other waste from building demolition, a process that continued sporadically into the 20th century. Little information about the excavations had been recorded, and nearly all knowledge of them, and of Williamson's life in general, was derived from an 1845 account of James Stonehouse. Although not published at the time, it was written, and was referenced in Stonehouse's later works, and was finally reprinted in full by Charles Hand, as part of a 1916 article about Joseph Williamson, the King of Edge Hill. The purpose of the excavations has been the subject of widespread speculation. According to Stonehouse's near-contemporary account, Williamson was very secretive about his motives, and this led to a great deal of speculative local folklore. Upon hearing that Stonehouse planned to publish his research on Williamson's excavations, Williamson's friend, the artist Cornelius Henderson, threatened to sue Stonehouse both for libel and trespass, leading to the paper's suppression for some years. Williamson's own explanation was reputed to be that his motive was the employment of the poor. His workers all received a weekly wage, and Williamson claimed that he was able to build their self-esteem. Another suggestion is that Williamson was a member of an extremist religious sect, fearing that the end of the world was near and that the tunnels were built to provide refuge for him and his friends. Sadly, no evidence has ever been found to support this idea. 
Another idea, supported by Stonehouse, was that the tunnels were just a folly, the work of an eccentric man. More recently, research by academics at Edgehill University has concluded that the tunnels were in fact the result of work by Williamson to restore ground levels after quarrying. During Williamson's lifetime, it was locally rumoured that he was earning large sums from unlicensed quarrying. Williamson had apparently claimed that he made little money using extracted sandstone largely within his own properties. It seems possible that his secrecy was at least partly driven by his need to conceal his avoidance of both large amounts of income tax and mineral right duties due to West Derby Waste Commission from the sale of the Stanstone. So that's basically my condensed story of the Williamson Tunnels. Nobody really knows why they were built or what their purpose was. One thing I would say in finishing is that Williamson seemed to be very lucky because among the poor people that he found and employed, he found people who could build cathedral-like structures underground. I'm surprised he found so many people like that with such skills just hanging around waiting to be given something to do. Okay, so as always, thank you very much for watching and we'll catch up soon.